Paul continues his letter to the Galatians, seeking to get them back to their confidence in the goodness of God. Galatians chapter 2, verses 17 to 19. But if, in our endeavour to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live to God. Let's look at those verses closely. Verse 17. If in our endeavour to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. Being justified in Christ means this, that God has made you good through Jesus Christ. God sees you as good, God declares that you are good, and God has made you good through Jesus Christ. Not based on how well you perform, what you do, what you don't do, but simply because of Jesus Christ. You are justified in Christ. It is just as if you've never sinned. So here Paul asks the question, since we are being justified by Christ and we are constantly choosing to put our trust in the fact that we're justified by Christ, does this then mean that it doesn't matter if we sin? Because as we go about our lives as justified people, we do still sin at times. We are found to be sinners. So since we're justified, God declares us to be good, and yet at times we sin, does that mean that it doesn't matter that we sin? Even more, does it mean that Christ Jesus actually is helping us to live a life where we can sin and it's all okay? And Paul's answer to that is certainly not. It'll be helpful to look for a moment at what the word sin means. In the original languages in which the Bible was written, Hebrew, Greek, the word sin has a very specific meaning. It comes from archery and it means to miss the mark. So if you're firing a bow and arrow at a target and you don't hit dead center, you've missed the mark. Or if you're playing darts and you don't hit the bullseye, you've missed the mark. Every time we miss the mark in our lives, we're sinning. And what is the mark? The mark is love. Pure, true love. To love God, to love others, and in the appropriate ways to love ourselves, every time we miss that mark, then we're sinning. We may miss the mark by a little way, or we may completely miss the target. Either way, we've missed the mark, and that's sin. We all miss the mark at times. And yet God says that we're justified in Christ. He declares that we are good. We are innocent before him. So once again, does this mean that it doesn't matter that we miss the mark? Absolutely not. Does it mean that Christ is in fact helping us to live a life where it doesn't matter that we sin? Absolutely not. Paul goes on in verse 18. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. Now bear in mind that he's writing this letter to the Galatians because they've been seduced and tricked by some false teachers into thinking that they should live their lives based on a structure of rules and laws and principles, a standard that they've got to constantly try to meet. They're going to be waking up every morning thinking, I have somehow got to meet all these standards. And that's called living by the law. The opposite of that is living in the goodness of God, justified by God through Jesus Christ, that being our starting point, waking up in the morning and saying, thank you, God, that I'm good before you. I'm innocent before you. And basing our life on that kind of approach. 
So when Paul says, if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor, what he's actually saying is if I try to go back to living my life on the basis of that structure of expectations and rules and performance, then I'm just going to find out even more clearly that I'm a transgressor, that I'm a sinner, that I keep crossing those boundaries that I couldn't cross, that I keep missing the mark. Because that's what the law does. It points out our failure to hit the mark. It points out our failure to hit the bullseye. Think of it this way. If you were learning to play darts, or if you had someone training you to be an archer and to hit the target, think of it like this. If you had two teachers, one on your left, one on your right, two teachers with two very different approaches and attitudes to your dart playing or your archery, the teacher on the left Whenever you miss the the central target, the bullseye, he says, oh, come on, you keep failing, you keep missing, can't you do better? The teacher on the right, if you miss the bullseye, if you miss the, the, the center of the target, says, have another go, keep trying, you'll get it. And if you've, in the past, not even hit the target, but the the dart has gone through the window or the arrow has gone off into the field. But this time you got it somewhere on the dart board or somewhere on the archery target board. The teacher on the right will say, well done, you're getting closer. Keep trying. Two different kinds of teachers. The teacher on the left is like the law. All it can do is point out what you're doing wrong and how much you should be doing right. Whereas the teacher on the right-hand side, he's acknowledging that there's things you're doing wrong and that you need to improve and do better. But his approach is to treat you as someone who's trying, to treat you as someone who's got the potential to hit the mark, to teach you, treat you as someone who's learning and growing, to treat you as someone who should be forgiven for not hitting the mark. That's far more motivating. Again, Paul says, if I rebuild what I've torn down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. He's saying that if we try to live our lives on the basis of that law, those rules, those principles, those regulations, rather than on the basis of grace, of the goodness of God. If we try to do that, in fact, what it does is it stirs up in us those failures. If you see a sign on a, on a table saying, do not touch this table, It's interesting, isn't it, that there's something inside that says, I I need to touch it. Or if you see a sign on a door says, do not go in this room, it makes you want to go in. The law is good. We need to have that measurement, that measuring stick by which to look at how we're living and what needs to change and improve. Remember, God's law is the law of love. All of God's laws that he's ever communicated to mankind have all been designed to teach mankind to love. That's a good thing. There are lots of ways that you and I need to learn how to love better. And it's good that those things are pointed out to us. The law is a good thing. It serves its purpose. But it's not enough. It doesn't give us the power to actually hit the mark. In fact, on its own, all it does is bury us in guilt, shame, and failure. It's not the basis that you can live, you should live on now. Because in Jesus Christ, you're justified already. Your starting point is, I am good. God has made me good. He declares that I'm good and innocent. And he's made me good because I am in Christ Jesus, who is perfectly good. That's your starting point. So you wake up in the morning, already a winner, And every time you fall, every time you miss the mark, you can get right back up again. And that's how God works. That's his goodness. That's his grace. When we fall, when we stumble, when we sin, he doesn't kick us while we're down. He gives us his hand and says, get up. Let's let's try again. I'm with you. Verse 19, Galatians 2 verse 19, for through the law, I died to the law so that 
I might live to God. This is a very, very powerful verse, and it's one that's worth learning and memorizing. Through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. This is saying there's two different ways of living. You can live for the law or you can live to God. One or the other. If you're living by the law, if your life is about trying desperately to hit that mark and being condemned when you fail and motivating yourself with guilt and constantly striving, struggling, never feeling like you're quite enough, then you're not free to really live for God fully. But here Paul says about himself and This means us as well. Through the law, I died to the law that I might live to God. What does he mean? Through the law, I died to the law. Jesus Christ died on the cross for you and me. Jesus Christ was a perfect person, the only perfect person. He never, ever did wrong. And yet when he hung on the cross for you and me, All of our wrongdoing, all of our sin, all of our missing the mark and failure was placed on him. He took the blame for you and me. He was crucified under the law, the law of God, that says that sin leads to death, that sin must have its punishment. Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross and took our sin was fulfilling the legal penalty and the legal consequence for our misdeeds and our our missing the mark. The law of God, the law of perfect love, demands that failure to hit the mark is accounted for. And so Jesus died under the law. In doing so, he fulfilled the law. The consequence, the punishment, the outcome of our failures was all put on him. And he paid it. He took it. The law was fulfilled in his life, in that he loved perfectly. And the law was fulfilled in his death, in that our failures to love were accounted for and made up for, so to speak. He died under the law. And because you and I, if we identify with Jesus, we died with him. This is a spiritual reality. Obviously, we weren't there 2,000 years ago, hanging on a cross with him. But his death on the cross is accounted to us. Spiritually, it's like we were there with him because our sins were placed on him. Our sinful, fallen, broken nature died with him when he died on our behalf. And then gloriously, he rose from the dead and we rose in him to new life. That's what baptism represents. You go down into the water and that signifies your sinful life, dying with Jesus. You're identifying with him. Your sins, your shortcomings, your failures and mine too, all taken care of, paid for, washed away. Just like when he died and all of our sin was taken. And then you're raised up out of the water and that signifies that new life that you've begun in him. Where the sin is broken, accounted for and therefore gone. And where you have now a life lived fully in the power of God and in the love and grace of God with nothing standing in the way. That's baptism. If you haven't been baptized, then I highly encourage you to talk to your church leaders and arrange that. It's very powerful. So through the law, I died to the law. Through the law, you died to the law. Because Christ died under the law and we died in him. But we've been given new life 
in Jesus. Through the law, I died to the law, that I might live to God. God is a God of life. He wants us to live, and he wants us to live to the full. Think about it. Whose idea was the universe in all its glory and splendor and majesty and beauty? From the reaches of the furthest cosmos to the tiny details in an ant or the amazing design of your brain and mine and the wonderful experiences and emotions that we can have in life. Relationships, all of this beauty and creativity and glory was designed by God. He's a God of life, a God of creativity, a God of relationship. He wants us to live. And so now that we're free from the burden of simply struggling and striving to hit that mark and failing, we're free to live for God. We're free to live our lives to God. In other words, we live our lives to the full. And it's like an offering to God, really. And it's one that really pleases him. Remember, God is love. When we learn to love ourselves, when we learn to love others, when we learn to love him, he's delighted. So think again of those two teachers. One on the left who's just pointing out your failure and berating you for it. And then the one on the right, who's well aware of your failure and who may well mention it, but who's just encouraging you that you can do it. You can hit that mark and that you're learning. Remember that the teacher on the right is delighted every time you get closer to the mark. That's what he's focused on. The law is focused on what we should and shouldn't do, and therefore it focuses hugely on failure. God is focused on our successes. He's aware of our failures. At times he has to address them. But it's all in the context of celebrating our successes, celebrating all the ways in which we're learning to love. So when you wake up tomorrow morning, think of your life ahead of you this way. Don't think, oh my God, I've got all these standards I've got to try and reach. I'm never going to be good enough. I'm going to keep failing. No. When you wake up, think to yourself. In fact, speak to God and say, thank you, God. You declare that I am good. You've made me good. I'm already a success in you. I want to hit that bullseye. I want to love the way I should love. Thank you for teaching me. Thank you for giving me the power and the strength to love. And then get up, get on with your day and enjoy the adventure of life with God. Let's read those three verses again just to recap. Galatians 2, 17 to 19. If in our endeavour to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live to God. Thank you, Father, that through your Son, who died for us on the cross, we have died to the law, and we are free to live to God. Teach us to love, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.